But we're, we're happy to have uh, uh, Pastor Turner with us this morning. One word I know we can definitely call him that has always been true, and that's preacher. Yes. Amen. So preacher, why don't you come on up and preach to us? Thank you, Pastor. Make sure I'm... Oh, I am on here, aren't I? Mike was already on? Not on? All right, let me pull it off and see what's wrong here. I preach in so many places, I have like 10,000 different mics they use. There we go. And they all have different buttons and different directions, and some are upside down and some are sideways, and so you have to kind of have a little head start to get that done. Take your Bibles this morning, and I'll address you in just a minute, but Psalm chapter 1, you can be finding your place. You can tell there's a bunch of Baptists here today. They're all sitting in the back, my wife and Barbara, some of the cabbage patch. And, you know, when we get to heaven, they have the marriage supper of the Lamb. There'll be a lot of tables up front empty. <laughs> some of you get that in a minute. Probably be some places empty that we thought would be full anyhow. People who uh, profess to know the Lord that really don't. And we might be surprised a little bit at some who don't profess that we, we think aren't saved that might really be born again and be there. Be kind of interesting, won't it? One thing I know is I am and I'm going to be there. Amen. Good to see, I started to say old friends, friends from the past. Let me just put it that way because I don't like that old thing. I was thinking about this the other day. Some of you that are, you know, in, close to my age in the 60s or whatever, uh, they say we're probably going to live to about 75 maximum. So we're almost done. <laughs> I got thinking about that. I don't like that. Somebody said, does that bother you? It doesn't bother me. We'll just be going to heaven. I said, yeah, I know that. And, and death has no, not got any sting for the believer, but dying does. That croaking part, I'm not really into that. I've watched a lot of, y'all were kind of dead this morning. <laughs> y'all had a bad night? Were y'all drinking or something or what? I mean, y'all look awful. I'm saying no one wants to go through the croaking part, right? The dying part. We all know that death doesn't hold any sting for a believer. But I, I look forward to... Being here today, Mr. Turner and I are going, this is going to be our sending church for, for our evangelism ministry, and so we're going to join at 11 o'clock, and this will be our authority church and where our tithes and offerings will come, and uh, so that's the reason we made this trip, and then I preached a men's conference uh, Friday and Saturday with Brother Gibbs from Christian Law Association, and, and then uh, we'll head out of here today and drive Reba's uh, niece, niece, nephew. Uh, Brian uh, is dying, and they probably will pull the uh, plug today, life support, and so we're headed there. Family called and asked if I'd come and do the funeral, and so then I'll hustle back to Richmond, Indiana, where I'm living. I'll have probably a day to recoup and head to Chicago to preach a revival, and then I'm done there in three weeks back-to-back -back in Missouri, and then I'll be done in Missouri and then back to Indiana and uh, just busy, 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 but it's fun. Uh, it's a delight to preach the Word of God. I love this book yeah. and I love to preach it around the country and I love to be able to give people hope for eternity, to help them know that Jesus is real and that religion has falsified the way to heaven and built their own structure, but there's only one way to really get to heaven and that is by knowing the Lord Jesus Christ personally as your Savior. And as I look across uh, the auditorium today, I think back to 1974 when I came here and this church was planted. And, and I think, you know, praise the Lord, if, if nothing else, some of you came to know the Lord as the result of this church being planted here. And that's a wonderful thing. Amen? It's a wonderful thing. Uh, you have the Psalms chapter 1. If you do, why don't you uh, stand and... Uh, we'll read the scripture, and while you're doing that, let me come down where you are, especially since this is Sunday school, and I, I kind of 
over the years, I've, I've gotten more and more uh, in, unstable and unhappy about being behind pulpits. I, you know, there's so, and not that it's wrong or anything, it's not, but I, I feel so much the importance of people knowing that, at least for me, and, and I'm sure Brother uh, Carney feels the same way, that we know we're no different than you are. We're sinners saved by grace. The only, the only difference between me and you right now is I stand with God's authority to preach the Word. Uh, but I need it as bad as you need it. Hello? Yeah. Do you not need it? Yeah. We all need it. Yeah. And we need to recognize that we need it and that it needs to change our lives and that it is the only thing that can change our lives. So let's read Psalms chapter 1 together if we could. And uh, then uh, I want to kind of illustrate some things out of this chapter. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to bless this morning as we open your word. And Lord Jesus, I, I pray that if there's anyone in this place today that uh, does not have assurance that if uh, life would uh, come to a conclusion for them today, that they would just be absent from this physical body and present with the Lord, then I pray that this would be the day that they would be challenged to put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that their sins are forgiven and heaven is their home. And I pray, Father, for God's people. What a grave day we live in. Paul said to Timothy that we are living in perilous times. And Lord, we are in perilous times because I believe God's people have failed in the way we walk. So help me today to encourage those who are saved to live like it to act like it, to talk like it, to look like it, to behave like children of God, to be the light and the salt in a very, very dark and unsavory place. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me by giving me the anointing to preach your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth uh, in the seat uh, of the scornful. Let me get these three boys right here. Come on, Carney's boys. Would you come up here and you're going to help me this morning? And uh, let me illustrate what God is saying. Let, let me have you sit here by, by height. Who's the tallest you are, I guess? No? no? Oh, too bad. Too bad. Too bad. Sit down now. So, man, he said, this is humiliating, isn't it? Well, you'll survive. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. God says that there is a way for, and when we say man, you understand we're talking about mankind here. Not just men, but mankind. And God said there is a way for mankind to be blessed. And the word blessed is well defined throughout scripture. It's used often. It just means happy. Happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, happy is the Christian who behaves themselves spiritually, who walks with God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now for a minute, I'm going to be ungodly. All right? And I want to bring my first little victim up here. And we're going to walk, we are going to walk together. 
God says, don't walk. I'm ungodly, okay? You remember that now, all right? And we're going to walk together in the counsel of the ungodly. He's going to walk with me. God said, don't do it. In fact, in Proverbs 1, he said, if sinners entice thee or encourage you, consent thou not. Mrs. Reagan thought she figured that out when she said, just say no to drugs. But God said, just say no, way back in Proverbs chapter 1. If sinners try to get you to sin, just say no. God said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You know, walking in the counsel of the ungodly involves listening to ungodly counsel. Are you all with me here now? And so, you know, you're just walking along. How this happens in life. Someone ungodly. And by the way, I hear this all the time. Well, I'm a Christian and I'm dating this guy, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to bring him to Christ. Truth of the matter is, most often I see it go the other way. The ungodly draws the so-called godly person away. And so walking in the counsel of the ungodly means to listen, to, to become a partaker in the ungodly counsel of the person who's trying to destroy your life. And so you're just walking. And somewhere along the line, I'm saying uh, to Mr. Carney here, Mr. Carney, you need to sin. Now I'm saying to him, you need to smoke and you need to drink and you need to do all these things that are not uh, biblical in your life. And we're just walking along. And he is listening to me and he must make a determination, listen to me, whether he will just say no to me or whether he will let that process develop in his life. Now hold on. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, nor, if you go long enough, it just keep, continues developing until you grow a little bit older and a little bit taller, and you're not just walking and listening, but it has been in your ear long enough that the Bible said, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of, of the ungodly, nor standeth, in the way of the sinners. You see, when you're walking, you're listening. But at some point, when you are standing, you are lingering, and you are taking it in, and you are beginning to decide, I'm not only going to listen to this, but I'm going to let it become the position of my life. And so you linger. You walk. You don't say no. You don't sit down. You just keep involving yourself in the ungodly counsel and you're walking in that ungodly counsel and you're listening to those ungodly advices and you're letting it be part of your life and then at some point in your life you listen to the point that you are comfortable with hearing ungodly advice. You're so comfortable with it that the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. He becomes comfortable in the way of sinners. You did great right there, all right? And then the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Or this guy has come to the place in his life that he's walked long enough and he's stood around and listened long enough that he is so comfortable with sin that he will sit, just sit down here. He will sit down any time I want to give him ungodly counsel. He is comfortable enough to just sit right down and let it be part of his life. There's a progression to sin. Are you getting what I'm saying? You know, young people all the time say to me, uh, well, I know I've got some friends that really aren't the best friends I ought to have. And by the way, I hear this all the time. It makes me want to vomit. Oh, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Do you think that Jesus, that Jesus was a friend of sinners to the point that he let them change his godliness? I say, do you think Jesus was a friend of sinners to the place he allowed them to change his godliness? Jesus went about healing the sick. Jesus went about saving the lost. He went about changing people's lives. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things are become new. Here's what I'm saying to you this morning. God is clear in his word that we must not receive the counsel of the ungodly. Now hear me. God said, 
Blessed is that man who learns to say, listen, I'm not even going to walk with you. I'm certainly not going to stand with you. And I am certainly not going to sit down and let you counsel me and participate in your sin. We are living in a generation, listen to me now, the reason America is in the trouble she is in today has very little to do with, and I'm, ag I'm against what God's against. I'm against everything God declares is wrong in the Bible. But America is not where she's at today because of the homosexual crowd or because of abortion or anything else. America is where she's at today because we have failed to be the light of the world. We have failed to be the salt. You know what he said? If salt loses its tastiness, its savor, the only thing good for it is take it out and throw it away. It's no good. I happen to like salt. I had a heart attack in 93, and the doctor said to me, now you're going to take this pill and this pill and this pill, and you can't eat this and you can't eat that, and you can't eat this and you can't eat that, and you've got to give away your salt. I said to him, listen, dude, I'll tell you this right now. I'll take this pill and I'll take that pill and I won't eat that and I won't eat that, but you're not getting my salt, amen? Because when you put food in your mouth that doesn't have any salt on it, it the only thing it's good for is to take out and throw away somewhere, amen? I, I, I want salt on my food. And here's what God said. Are y'all listening to me this morning? God said, if you're a Christian and you're not salty, you're not providing some spiritual salt to the world, you're no, you're no better than to take out and throw out in a trash heap somewhere. And he said, if you're not the light of the world, he said, if you're not being the light of the world, then I'm going to come and I'm just going to snuff out your whole light. And that's exactly what's happened in America. Now listen to me. I preach all over this country and all around the world, and I can tell you, Christianity is in bad shape. Do you know in America, 50 years ago, we were presenting missionaries all around the world. Do you know where the missionaries are coming from now? They're coming from the Philippines to us. We have lost our salt and we have lost our light and our churches have become comfortable with being less than what God demands out of the Word of God. And as a result of it, I'm in churches every week, almost every night of every week. I'm just getting ready to do 21 straight nights of evangelism in Missouri. And I can tell you, I'm in churches that people sit in church and they sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but they look like a shark getting ready to bite somebody. They look like a crocodile getting ready to snap down on somebody. There's no joy in their heart. And Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And God said that joy or that happiness comes in our life when we learn to walk a proper life. Amen? When we do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now let's go back to Psalms 1 and verse number 2. Look at this. He said, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But, look at this now, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now the word law of the Lord, or phrase law of the Lord, is referring to God's commandments and statutes in the word of God. Did you know that in the book of Exodus, God gave us his law? How many of you knew that? The book of Exodus, remember? Hello! Do you remember when Moses went up onto the mount and he came down and he gave God's law to Israel? Do you remember that? All right. And then we find out when we come to the book of Deuteronomy that the, the law is being repeated. I wonder if you know this. The book of Deuteronomy, the definition of the Deuteronomy is the second law. Did you know that? God had to repeat all that because Israel had already begun to forget what God had given them and to depart from the law of God. Are you all with me right now? I, I, I've been preaching now for 45 years, and I can tell you this. When I was a boy, the, whatever God said, that was just the way it was. Amen? It, you know, it used to be if God said it, I'm for it. But today, everybody's wanting to kind of redesign the plan of God and say, well, the culture has changed and, and life is different and, and so the church can't be relevant today. Well, I want to tell you, God gave the first law. He gave in the Deuteronomy the second law and I believe God wants preachers today to remind us that the law of God is perfect. 
and that the Bible is still the Word of God. Amen? And that if we're going to have a good society, and if we're going to have good homes, and if we're going to have good churches, and if we're going to have a good community, we're going to be good because we believe and practice the laws of God. Amen? Now God says, Blessed or happy is that man who won't walk in ungodliness. And by the way, ungodly just means not godly, not like God. So blessed is the man that will not walk with those who are not like God. So here's my advice to you young people. When you pick friends, pick friends that are godly. They are like God. They practice what God wants them to practice and avoid those that are ungodly. Now I am no way saying to you that we should be snooty. I'm not saying to you that because we're Christians, we should walk up with our nose in the air, walk around with our nose in the air, being holier than thou. I used to say uh, at Westgate, I used to say to our church people, some of you got your noses so high in the air, you're so proud of yourself. If it came a good floor to rain, you'd drown. Amen? I mean, the, the water would go down your nose so fast you'd drown because you think you're somebody. Can I remind you who you are this morning? At your very best this morning, you are a sinner saved by grace. Amen? At your very best, you're something rotten that God, by His grace, has made all right in the sight of God. You are something that God has sanctified uh, by His precious blood and made presentable. That's why religion is no good. Are you listening to me? That's why religion fails because religion says if you'll join our church and our faith and go by our rules, you'll make it to heaven. God said none of you are able to make it to heaven and none of you can follow any rule and get to heaven. You're all guilty of breaking my law, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The only way you're ever going to get to heaven is to understand that you must come to Jesus Christ and let him be your Savior, amen? Now when he becomes your Savior... The Bible says that he indwells. Do you know the Bible says that we are in Christ and Christ is in us? That's where the phrase came from, ask Jesus into your heart. I don't like that term. I tell the workers that I've worked with and trained over the years, don't tell kids to invite Jesus into their heart. And about a year later they're saying, I wonder if he's still in there. Where's he at in there? I mean, that's, tell them that they need to be forgiven of their sin. Ask Jesus to forgive your sin and cleanse you from your sin. Tell them exactly what needs to be done to be born into the family of God. But truly, He does indwell us. <clears throat> we are in Him and He is in us. Are we all together on this? Yeah. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. In other words, if we walk with the ungodly, we're going to get everything we need to live an ungodly or not godly life. But if we walk with God, we have everything we need to live a godly or godlike life. God gives us all of the things we need to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world in which we live. Does that make sense to you this morning? So here's the difference. Just like the wiring of this building is wired into a big box and if the switch is not turned on, there would not be one light work in this place. The divine nature dwells within me, but if I do not take that power and use that power and accept that as the way to live my Christian life and I try to live it in the energy of this flesh, the spiritual light will not come on in my life. It will not work. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In other words, we love the word of God. Amen? Can I say this without being offensive? Most of you came to church without even thinking about the word of God today. I'll wipe my eyes so I don't see who's frowning at me. But it's true. The average Christian in America that picks up their Bible, maybe when they go to church on Sunday. I drive, I drive around the country, and you know where most Bibles are found by me? They're either on the dashboard of the car, or they're in the back window of the car, and the sun's beating them, and they're ripped up and torn and twisted and curled from the heat. You know why people don't know how to live their lives? Because they don't know what the Word of God says. 
because we have not gotten involved in the Word of God. We've not read the Word of God. I meet young people all the time and they, they don't understand the issue of abortion and they don't understand the issue of homosexuality and they'll say, but I think, can I help you today? God doesn't give a flip what you think. Long before you were even a thought in the pattern of the mind of God, God had already given His law. You're either with me or against me here this morning. He'd already given His law. He didn't ask you now, if you think this would be all right, this is what I write. He said, this is my word. This is my law. Keep my commandments. He said in Deuteronomy 6, I've given you my commandments. I've given you my statutes. I've given you my judgments. I've given all of that to you so that when you go into the land of promise, you will do what I have told you to do. But I want to tell you, you cannot do what God has told you to do if you do not know what God has told you to do. Isn't that pretty simple? I was on a plane not too long ago, and I went and took my seat, and I heard the guys in front of me, and they were kind of mumbling a little bit, and I listened in, and, and they were kind of complaining because it was a woman pilot. And, uh, and I said to them, guys, I don't care if it's a woman pilot. I just want to know if she's read the manual. So what do you mean? I said, I want to know if she's learned how to fly this plane. Hello? I want to know if that plane gets into trouble, does she know what to do? I want to know. I want to know if we hit an air pocket and that plane goes down a couple thousand feet, does she know how to get it back on course? I don't want her to come out of the cockpit and say, we just had a tragedy here, but don't worry, I slept at Holiday Inn Express last night or whatever that is. That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear her come over and say, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a little bit of trouble, but don't worry, I know what to do, and I'm moving the plane out of this cell and getting into some better weather. Everything is going to be fine. Just make sure your seatbelts are buckled and relax, and I'll take care of it. And God said, I want you to know, I've written everything you need to live a godly life. I know what is best for you. I know how to take care of you. Just buckle your seatbelt and let me be God in your life. Amen? Now, here's what he says. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he doth meditate therein day and night. This word meditate is an awesome word. This word meditate here means to wallow in. Now, I've had a lovely life. I, I think I've had the best life in that I was born and raised on a farm, and then I came up here and you all cultured me. You New Englanders helped me to learn how to live a cultured life, you know. And I took off my cowboy boots and put on shoes and things like that. Amen? Huh? And a what? And you gave me all the leisure suit. Yeah, that was a mess. I... First time I wore that, they asked me to preach there. I'm in this old leisure suit. But I'm glad those things went bye-bye. But I would tell you, I, I was raised on a farm. I know about wallowing. I know about wallowing. How many of you know anything about pigs? So the only pig I know is the one I'm married to that throws his socks on the floor. Amen. Why did you look at him? <laughs> oh, yo, me. Pick your socks up, bud. All right. I know about pigs, and I know pigs like to get right up to their nose in mud. Anybody been around pigs? Anybody at all? I mean real pigs now. Let's, yeah, I'm talking about your husband here. All right. Real pigs. When I was a kid, we used to have a big barrel in our house. Are you all listening now? There was a big barrel in our house, and everything we didn't eat went in that barrel. It was called the slop barrel. And all, what time am I done, preacher? Quarter till? Uh, ten till. Ten till, thank you. And all, everything went in that, and then at, when we needed to slop the hogs, we'd go outside and call the hogs. You've heard me call the hogs, so I won't bother doing that today. But we'd go out and we'd yell, suey, suey, I'm really loud. And those pigs would come, I'd be, wah, 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 wah. and they'd get up there. They knew they were about to get slopped. And you pour that slop. Now, now, I've been told now you've got to boil all that before the pigs can have it and all that bunch of garbage. But anyhow, we poured over there and those pigs would fight for it and they'd eat all that garbage. And then when they were done, they'd go back and 
they were excellent at just digging out little holes <coughs> and getting the, <coughs> getting the mud all uh, packed up there and then they'd get their little bodies and, <coughs> and they'd just get themselves down in that mud and pretty soon you could barely just see their little eyes sticking up above the mud. That's called wallowing, amen? And God said, listen, here's what I want you Christians to do. I want you to meditate and the word comes from the root word to wallow. He said, I want you to wallow. I want you to get down in the Word of God and get it all over you. Get yourself down in to the Word of God until it just saturates you and it's all over you. And because it is all over you and it is all in you, it will come out in your life. Let me say to you, it is sad today that most Christians could not be convicted of being a Christian if they were brought to a court of law. I remember a book written back in the 70s when the Russians were trying to take over. They said they would take over. Khrushchev said, we'll take over America without a shot because we will win the hearts of their young people through education. And boy, have they done it. They have done it. And there was a, a book written, and the guy asked in the book, if you were ever tried as a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What if today our government became socialistic and, and, and as I have a preacher friend who's in China right now and the Chinese follow him around literally watching every step he makes and he could be at any moment arrested and put in jail for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What if they did that to you? How strong would your Christianity be? What if today they said we'll take your children away because you're teaching them something that's not good for them. Let me tell you now, they're telling you you have to give them shots because if you don't give them shots, you're not a good parent. You got to do this because if you don't do this, you're not a good parent. And the day will come when religion will be part of that. What kind of Christian would you be? I'm going to tell you, we better get into this book and get it into us. We better wallow in it until it becomes part of our Christian life experience so that we know what God expects out of us and we're not walking with the ungodly, but we're walking in the light of God's Word. Amen? His delight is in the law of the Lord. I've got to hurry here. Now, let's, let, me, let me read these verses and I'll just kind of shoot these out like a, like a bullet firing out of a gun. Here, verse 3. If you do what God says, you do not walk with the ungodly. You all with me still? Yeah. Verse 1 is don't walk with the ungodly. Say it with me. Don't walk with the ungodly. Number 2, delight in his law. Say it with me. Delight in his law. Verse 3, he said if you do that, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Let me give you three quick thoughts and we'll be done. Number one, he said, if you walk with God, you'll be planted. Do you know how many people in America, they have no sure footing at all. They don't know what's going on in their life. From day to day, they don't know how to live. And, and they live from one whim to another whim. And from one drink to another drink. And from one drug to another drug. And from one friend to another friend. And from one fame and fortune to another fame and fortune. And they lose it all trying to find happiness. But God said, no, no, no. If you'll find happiness in my word, you'll be planted. Amen? And you'll be planted like a tree by the rivers of water. When I was a boy, my dad believed in uh, working eight hours and fishing 12. That was what he believed in. And I spent a lot of time growing up as a kid on a riverbank fishing with my dad. So much I used to pray, dear God, help the fish not to bite so we can go home. But I learned a lot about life on the riverbank. And I learned a lot. You can look at trees all through the forest around you and they'll be dry and dead and falling over and you can go down by the riverbank. Are you listening to me now? Yeah. And there would be a tree and the roots of that tree had broken through the riverbank and worked their way down into the water and they had 
uh, drunk from that water uh, of that, that uh, river and, and it had given life to that tree and it became tall and firm and the green leaves broke out on that tree and it looked so stable. God said, listen, if you won't walk in the advice of the ungodly, but you'll walk in the advice of the word of God, you'll be like a tall tree that is planted and firm and able to drink the water of life. In other words, he said, your roots will go down into the Bible and they'll suck out the water of life from the word of God and it'll make you a tall strong tree that is able to uh, live and exist when everything around you is dying and boy that's the society we're living in say amen, amen. it's dying all around us you know what breaks my heart there's a number of parents who aren't giving their kids the information to know how to be a tree that's planted hello the number of grandparents who aren't raising up there, helping their children raise the grandkids and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. People say to me all the time, you're sure awful busy with your family and it seems like you interfere in their life a lot. You bet I do. I'm going to do everything I can to interfere in their life and make sure they're walking with God because I know the consequences of not walking with God. And I want them to be blessed. And you know what? When we're dead and gone, we grandparents are dead and gone, I want my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and their children, I want them to know Jesus the Savior and I want them to love God and walk with God and I want them to make heaven their home someday. Amen? Amen. Listen now, be planted. And then he said not only that, but they'll bear fruit. They'll be productive. They'll be productive. Listen, you know what? Most Americans I know, their lives are so bitter and so unhappy and so unfocused and so much a lack of joy in their life. Can I say this to you today? You get plugged into the Word of God, it'll make you planted like a tree by the river of water. It'll make your life productive. Somebody said to me, you don't have much in this life. That's true, I don't. But I'll tell you one thing. My life's productive. Everywhere I go, I'm winning people to Christ. I got a letter just yesterday, an email just yesterday from a young man whose life I affected years ago in Australia who's gone off to Bible college and graduated now. And now he's going uh, uh, to Myanmar as a missionary. Uh, productive. Your, our lives will be productive. You say, but I do this and I do that. Yeah, and all of that's going to be rolled up one day like a scroll and burned with a fervent heat and everything that's here is going to be worthless. Your bank account will be gone. Hello? This whole world will be gone. Only what we do for Christ will last. Amen? Amen? Be productive. And then lastly, he said, not only that, you'll bear fruit. But he said, your leaf shall not wither. God said, not only will you be planted, not only will you be productive, but he said, I want you to know you will be protected. Doesn't matter what happens in your life, I'll be there for you. I could give you a sob story this morning, I won't. But I can tell you life's difficult sometimes and financially it's a burden. But I can tell you, Ms. Turner and I were talking about this yesterday, how God has met every need that we have. And in the strangest ways, God has said it doesn't matter. You don't need that assurance and you don't need that proof and you don't need that guarantee. I'm your proof and I'm your guarantee. And I'll take care of you. Your leaf shall not wither because I'm in control of your life. I want to say to you, my, my counsel to you is don't walk with the ungodly. Don't stand with the ungodly. Don't sit down and get comfortable with the ungodly. You hear me, boy? <laughs> but rather, seek the truth of God's Word. Find your delight. Wallow in the Word of God. Get it all over you so you know how to live. And God said, when you do, I'll plant you by the river of water and I'll make you productive and I'll protect you and your life will be a blessed life. You know this, I can say this, to, I'm 62 years old. I won't go down in the who's who of anything and maybe except troublemakers. But I'll tell you this, when the day comes that they put me in a casket and up in front of whatever church it happens to be in or wherever it happens to be, and they say his life is over, I can tell you that I'll be able to have said this. I leave this world with no regrets. I trusted him as my savior as, as a boy of six. 
and I've given him my whole life. He is my life and my glory, and I live for him, and he has planted me, and he has made me productive, and he promises that he will protect me. My encouragement to you is walk with the Lord. Amen? Let him be your life. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for this wonderful time uh, in the Sunday school hour, and what a blessing to be with uh, this church and, <clears throat> and folks uh, who used to be here <clears throat> in years gone by and to see them again and, and to fellowship together. And Lord, we're, we're delighted uh, to have this opportunity today and, and uh, in just a few minutes for my family to come back uh, to the roots of, of where we started in 1974 and make this again our church home. Lord, I pray today uh, by your grace that you'd help us all to avoid the counsel of the ungodly and walk in the godliness provided through the word of God, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.